everybody, as you may recall, the day before our grand opening, I came rushing into the building with a bin that said venomous reptiles on the side of it. I didn't show you what was in said bin, but we have gotten so many requests to show you the species that we brought here to the zoo that day. So today we are going to introduce you to our timber rattlesnake. Justin Timber Snake is our six to seven year old timber rattlesnake and he is a gorgeous guy. And today we actually have to go in and clean up some of his urates that he left behind and we have to upright some of his plants, just kind of reorganize because he likes tipping things over from time to time. So we thought we'd use this opportunity to introduce you all officially to Justin. So the first thing we have to do since we don't want him in here while we're cleaning is we actually have to take him out of the enclosure and we'll probably show him to you a little bit closer then. We'll put him in a bucket, then we'll clean, and then we might actually feed him in today's video too. He is one of the main reasons why we took the venomous snake handling and relocation course in California with Save the Snakes Foundation and it definitely helped us out a lot when it comes to handling him. So uh, I figured I'd say all that now because once I open this up I have to be looking completely at him so I won't be able to look at the camera but we are going to take him out. He's actually a really polite boy. He's he's a good uh, rattlesnake. He rattles a little bit of course like he's going to now I'm sure or he's not even gonna rattle. There it is. Hey bud, just gonna move your cork. I know, you love your cork. Hello! Don't mind me. <laughs> Instantly not rattling. Yeah, he's like, oh, okay, now we're moving. We're just gonna move you over here so we can take a good look at you while you're out. There he is! Here is Justin. We're gonna keep him on this towel so that he has a little bit of traction and doesn't slide around on it. And it's also a good marker for what I want to keep him on and uh, not let him slither any further away from me than on the towel. So Justin is a great little timber rattlesnake. He was originally kept in Oklahoma by a private keeper where he was actually used in educational programs like traveling programs. It sounds like the, uh, his keeper brought him to like fire departments to help train firefighters on how to handle venomous snakes if they were to encounter them in the wild. So he's definitely used to being handled. He doesn't mind people looking at him in our zoo all day, every day. And he, like I said, really doesn't even rattle that much. He rattles when we take him out and sometimes when we open his door if it squeaks a little bit. But even right here, he's not like showing any defensive behaviors at all. Maybe a little tick of his rattle here and there. But he just wants to look around and explore. He has never even struck at us at all. He's only struck at his food and that it. So yeah, he's a very polite little timber rattlesnake. Yeah, he, the funny thing is he kind of looks at people as they're looking at him. Yeah, he's like, what are you looking at? And yeah, he'll follow people around. He goes to the uh, front of his glass and seems to beg for food from time to time. And yeah, we usually feed him like on Saturdays so people can watch him eat too. It's really interesting for, for even me to watch him eat. But he is gorgeous too. I just love the uh, characteristic chevron patterns down his side here, which timber rattlesnakes are known to have and his colors fade to this dark black coloration near the base of his tail. He has actually shed for us once now, I believe, so he gained another segment onto the end of his rattle, which by the way, using or looking at a rattlesnake's rattle isn't a good way to determine their age because sure, they do gain a new segment every time they shed their skin, but sometimes the segments fall off or break if they're like uh, attacked by a predator or if they just fall or slip or, you know, it just happens to break off. So if you see a rattlesnake with a short rattle, it could either be a young rattlesnake or it could be a very old one just with a broken off rattle. So it's not a very good way to determine how old they are. But this guy, we just know based on his previous keeper and what he told us that he's about six to seven years old. Another myth about just rattlesnakes in general is that babies are more dangerous than adults because they can't control their venom yield. And while it's true that babies might not have as much control over their venom as adults do, their venom glands are much smaller than adults are. So they can't do as much damage as an adult can. That's really just a big myth that babies are more dangerous than adults. Timber rattlesnakes are also called uh, cane brakes down south, but they are the same species. The Crotalus horridus is their scientific name, and they are a species of pit viper, meaning they have, I'm trying to get them in a good position here, they have two heat sensing pits in between their eyes and their nostrils, and those pits are what allow them to see the infrared view of their surroundings, including their prey items. So they use those heat sensors to find like a warm-blooded mouse scurrying by, and they can locate it just by that, 
Smith, they also use their great sense of smell and their decent sense of eyesight to help locate their prey too. Now, since they are venomous, they obviously don't constrict their prey, but we'll actually get into how they feed or how they subdue their prey in a little bit. I think for now, we are going to set this big, beautiful boy in his travel bin or just his holding bin, which is actually a bucket. So for this, I'm gonna go back down to one hook. So my other hand has the lid. We're just gonna pick him up with the hook. I don't know if you saw that, but as soon as a rattlesnake like this is on the hook and suspended by the hook, they stop moving forward. And that's really because they think they're on a tree branch and they don't want to fall off of it. So uh, once you get them lifted off of the ground, they really stop trying to escape the hook. Granted, once they go in the bucket, it might be a different story, but there you go. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to spook you there. Actually, I did that wrong. I just realized I should have put pressure on the lid as I was screwing it on with this hook. So yeah, he was already, he was down at the bottom. He so was down in there. Yes. But yeah, now he's in his uh, bucket. So we are going to clean out his enclosure and we're going to show off how we specifically built his enclosure for a timber rattlesnake. All right. Well, now that he's in the bucket, I put on the glove, which sounds a little backwards, but I'll explain that in a second. This is his enclosure. This is Justin's enclosure. We took the glass out just for ease of filming today, but we don't normally take the glass out when we're filming or when we're uh, cleaning. It's just just for, so you can see things a little bit easier. And actually, Ed and I are the only ones that have anything to do with Justin. We figure we don't want to put our employees at risk at all, so it's just the two of us who open the enclosure for any reason whatsoever. But a couple of the precautions we've taken to ensure his safety and everybody else's safety is, first off, the glass. Just like the other rattlesnake enclosure we have down here, which we'll hopefully have for rattlesnake for soon, we have a much wider overlap between the panels of glass, so there's no chance at all of any fingers of any size being able to sneak in between that gap there. Uh, if you you compare it to like our bull snake or any other snake's habitat, the glass only overlaps about two, two and a half inches, whereas it's about a five, six inch overlap with the uh, with the hot species here. Also, we have two locks on the rattlesnake enclosures just for extra safety. And again, Ed and I are the only ones who really go in here. So the reason why I have the glove on is because rattlesnakes can actually shed their fangs. And if you were to shed or have dropped a fang in here and I reach in barehanded to like move a piece of cork or take out his water dish, it's a small chance but I still could possibly prick myself with one of those fangs and still have a small chance of getting envenomated and we don't want to take any chances whatsoever. So I wear the venom proof gloves when I'm moving things around in here or if I'm like refilling water, dumping out his water. On that same note, instead of reaching in with a hand to like remove a poop like we do with the other snakes, which I just realized probably sounds pretty gross. Eh, life of being in a zoo. Yeah, when you work in a zoo, you often don't have the time just to grab one of these. You just reach in and grab yeah. it and remove it. But I can't do that for the same reason I can't barehandedly move things around. So we just have a scoop, uh, just a little pan. And I basically just go in here and just scoop out your rates and then into the trash it goes. Hooray. Hooray. Cleaning. Cleaning snake poop. Cleaning rattlesnake poop. So we're going to move his cork back into place. As you can fix see. Those plants. Yeah, we're going to fix the plants. He loves to climb. I mean, they live in the uh, rocky outcrop areas in like the southeastern Minnesota. So we tried to replicate that here by having a couple native species of tree trunks in here. I think that was an ash of some sort. This is a river birch chunk, which <laughs> looks awesome in there. I love the salmon color underneath uh, river birches. And we also tried to add several grasses just to kind of look like more of a drier, more arid climate. These had like a pot, like I'll show you the some of the behind the scenes. These originally came with a big pot base and they just stood up like this high in the pot and that looked really tacky. So we cut off the base, which doesn't look any better, but we bury the base and you don't even see it. I'm just going to move it aside for now because there's another urate back here that I want to grab. He likes to hide his poops way nice. back in the corner where it's hard to reach. He does it to himself when we have to move him into a bucket to clean because there's no safe way to reach all the way back there while he's inside the habitat. We also made sure we put rocky outcrops that he could climb up. Yeah. Yeah, he climbs all around his backgrounds yeah. too. And we built this ledge specifically for him in hopes that he would coil up right here and be kind of covered just like rocks kind of overlap the soil on those rocky out outcrops in the wild. And he can like tuck underneath one of those crevices and like be sheltered at the same time. And he uses it. Mm -hmm. It's great. It's so cool seeing him in there. Yeah, he climbs all the way. He was yeah, up here yesterday. Day one, he was like up there. Yeah. Like, on the, the foamed part up there. And it's like, how did you? All right, whatever. I don't know. I don't know how he does it, but he's really good at climbing. Yeah. So we're just going to kind of reorganize or reset this stuff back up. Got some natural leaves from this area that are dried out and spread out for extra effect. And this grass actually is covered in urates anyway. So I guess I'll clean that before putting it back in. So yeah, got that cleaned out. His uh, water was just changed this morning, actually. So I don't have to change that right now. Yeah, it's a, that, that's his habitat. We have UVB up here in a wire grate that is sealed all the way around with screws 
permanently, not just clips that are removable like our, our other snakes. That was another precaution we took. And we've got LED lights just to illuminate it a little bit more. And this basking lamp up here, yep. which is shining this way towards his <clears throat> preferred or encouraged basking area right over there. So it's funny, his favorite spot though is on the cold end underneath his cork. Right there. He loves it there. Yep. And of course, that's right behind his name tag on the glass. So we might have to redo his name tag, like nah. the name sticker. Then people can look for him. Put it over here so they can see him under there. He'll just yeah. move over there if we do that. He probably would, yes. So that's pretty much his habitat setup. We just tried to replicate a rocky outcrop in southeastern Minnesota. I think it turned out pretty nice. He seems to enjoy it. He does use just about every inch of the enclosure, including the backdrop from Universal Rocks. That was all the cleaning we had to do today. So nothing too bad today. No big poops, just some urates. So we're going to put the glass back on and put him back in. All right, we're gonna take Justin out of his bucket and move him back into his enclosure. And speaking of his bucket, this is a very clearly labeled uh, venomous snake bucket. We actually got that sticker and the one on the other side from Save the Snakes while we were taking that venomous course. And we use them for Justin's bucket. It works really well. And yeah, we're just gonna take him out here. <laughs> a couple little tail rattles. Hi bud, you ready to come out? I think ready? he's gonna come out by himself. I guess he's gonna come out on his own. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for doing that. All right. Well, let's uh, move back into your enclosure here. There's your home. Yep. You know your home. Oh, not back out though. <laughs> We're not. He's like, I'm expecting food. You guys didn't feed me yet today. Yeah. You got to wait a little bit, buddy. And it is my day to eat. All right. And he's, he's back in. Uh, as you can see, I have a hook in one hand and a lid in the other. Uh, when we work with him, we try to keep both hands grasping something. So there's no instinctual urge to like reach forward and like do anything. So keep your hands busy basically is what we were taught. I think we're going to feed him next, right? Yeah. We're going to show him eating a small rat, I think. Yeah. I think we've got one ready for yeah. him. Thankfully he eats frozen thawed. He eats frozen thawed and pre-killed. We haven't tried live at all because there's really no point because he eats pre-killed and live or um, and frozen thawed. So we're going to give him a rat pup today. Here is our rat that we're going to be feeding today. Just a little rat. Oh, that was a really cute rat pup. Aww. Uh, Don't grow attached. He's not alive anymore. Yeah. I won't grow attached. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to feed this rat pup to Justin Timber Snake. And in the wild, what they do is they will uh, inject their prey with venom. So it's a really quick, it's like a, a bite or a, a tag type of bite where they kind of tag it and let go, but they're injecting it when they make contact with their prey item. And then they just kind of sit there. They wait for the prey item to run away and slowly die as the venom takes its toll on their body. And then the snake will actually follow the scent trail of that animal to the point where the animal is now dead and laying there and then they just eat it. So we try to replicate that in captivity by allowing him to strike the rat or mouse, whatever we're feeding him that day and then instead of just laying it right in front of him to eat like some keepers do we try to like drag it around his environment a little bit so he has to follow a scent trail like he would in the wild i don't know if he actually follows the scent trail or if he just sees oh that rat is over in the corner i guess i'll just go over there and eat it but we like to think that maybe it provides some mental stimulation for him uh so before i feed him the first thing i'm actually going to do is look in the enclosure and figure out where he's at and if he's in a good spot for me to be able to feed him if he's like right up front and right behind the glass I don't want to open the door and have him kind of fall halfway out and then try to feed him. That's just not, it's too risky. It's not going to be a good time. So we're going to wait until he's in a good position and then we're going to feed him. Okay, he's in a little bit better of a position. I'm actually going to go in on this side though. He's over there checking out his river birch. Hey buddy, do you want a tasty rat pup? Strike this guy. He's like, you've never fed me on this ledge before. Yeah, I am always under the cork when oh, you there we go. It. All right, so I'm going to just drop it down, drag it over here. And I'll go up over this rock and I'll put it on this rock right here. Perfect. We'll see what he does.
Northern Timber Snake, our timber rattlesnake, and he has been a very interesting addition to the snake discovery family. I never thought we would have a rattlesnake in our lives, and we were never planning on getting one until we opened up this educational facility. We decided, we discussed it, we decided that we would get a timber because we want to be able to educate people on all of the species of reptiles and amphibians that live in Minnesota while having some in person to teach people about up close, even though behind glass, so that they can learn how fascinating the timber rattlesnake is. And the more people learn and appreciate these really amazing snakes, the less likely they will be to kill them in the wild. What's really cool is we can use Justin here to show people in person the visual differences between timber rattlesnakes and other species in the area like fox snakes, which in our opinion are killed more frequently than any other species in Minnesota because they are mistaken for timber rattlesnakes. I mean, they take their tail even and they vibrate it and they sound like a rattlesnake. So a lot of Minnesotans unfortunately think they are one and then they kill it. Not that you should even kill rattlesnakes. Like these are amazing snakes to have around for especially pest control. And they're so important to the environment in general. But we uh, really want to teach people that fox snakes are different than timber rattlesnakes. Now, would we recommend that you get a rattlesnake as a pet? In most cases, no, absolutely not. We have seen it time and time again where people get into venomous species because they think they're cool and the element of danger makes them even more macho to own and show off. And you're you're just a cool person if you have a rattlesnake. They keep it kind of as like a trophy snake, but they are not properly trained in how to keep them responsibly and safely. And what happens in a lot of these cases is the keeper will have a close call where they are almost envenomated but they're not, thankfully, but it's enough to freak them out and make them drop the entire hobby, try to find homes for their snakes, which isn't fair on the snakes because they're just, they're just snakes. And it's also not fair on the people who feel obligated to take them in just to save the snakes. We actually have someone that we know um, personally in our area. He has a lot of experience with hots and a lot of people go to him when they have a close call and they have to, they want to get rid of their snakes and he feels obligated to take them in because he doesn't know where else they're going to go. And if they're is an instance where somebody is bitten by a venomous species, then it hits the news and becomes a huge story and it puts a really bad light on the reptile keeping community as a whole. So if someone is going to get into keeping venomous species, we think that they should mentor under someone who's experienced, get a lot of training first before you even get into them. Some people even recommend getting a pretty defensive or even what some people would consider an aggressive species of non-venomous snake to keep for a year and if you don't get bit for bit from it in a year then maybe you're ready to think about a venomous there's different thoughts on it but basically do it responsibly if you are going to keep something venomous there are actually lots of people out there who can do it successfully and they do a great job they keep it safe and the animals are healthy and well taken care of and it's just a good responsible situation altogether so it, it can happen but i guess i'll get off my soapbox <laughs> overall venomous snakes are not good pets in most instances. But that being said, I love Justin. He's an awesome snake. I'm glad we went through the training so that we know how to responsibly move him and take care of him. Yeah, he has been an interesting, a very, very fascinating uh, addition to the snake discovery family. So sorry about the rambling at the end of today's video here, but uh, as you can probably tell, this is a very important subject to Ed and myself for responsibly keeping potentially dangerous animals like this, because we really want the community, the reptile keeping community to move or to pr progress forward rather than backwards with new laws being put in place because of irresponsible pet keepers, basically. So yeah, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed today's video and uh, I hope you enjoyed the official introduction of Justin Timbersnake. Thank you as always to our generous Patreon backers as well, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>